you in today's video we are going to be looking at some of the mistakes that people make when setting up or using linux or specifically linux desktop so this video is my own opinions i have been using linux for around like two and a half years now so i have made a lot of mistakes on my end when it comes to using different linux distros i've made a lot of tutorials when it comes to the gaming side of things and just basic setup of different distros so i feel like i can share some of the mistakes that maybe a new user is going to have when they they try a specific Linux distro of any kind, really. I think one of the first mistakes that a user might do when installing Linux may think that everything is going to work out of the box straight away. And most of the time, it is like that. Most of your peripherals will just work out of the box. But sometimes there is some peripherals that will just won't work for some reason, or you may have to install a custom driver that's not included in the Linux kernel because the Linux kernel, it has drivers inside of it, usually kernel drivers, which make the peripheral work properly so sometimes sometimes devices don't work on linux out of the box but i think that is one of the misconceptions is that linux is the same as windows or mac os and the user goes to install linux for the first time and they're really excited to try it and then they install like arch linux for some reason or i don't know maybe let's say linux mint or pop os those type of like really easy distros and then a device doesn't work. So I think any users that are watching this video who haven't switched over to Linux yet or haven't tried it, just be wary that when you go to install Linux, I definitely would do your research about the peripherals that you have. I made some videos about things like peripherals and how they work on Linux and like what GUIs you can use to get the device working properly. One example of one of my friends who wanted to try out VR on Linux with the headset that he had. And the headset that he had was a Vive Cosmos most elite. Now this VR headset does not work on Linux for some reason. The actual driver on the display isn't supported in the kernel. No one has tried to reverse engineer it all. I did find some forums and some GitHub issues opened about it and some people were able to get a little bit further when it comes to the getting the driver working but overall it didn't work and SteamVR didn't pick it up. So it's just like one example of a device that you'll try and set up and you'll just expect it to work and it's like nope it doesn't work because well Vive doesn't support really Linux that well and the drivers that are supported are usually just reverse engineered drivers so then the display can work on Linux in you know like a Steam VR space. Now the next one uh, is you might already know this and I always try to tell people to not go in this direction in the first place and it's usually because when someone goes to search for a Linux distro they'll find a distro like Linux Mint for example that's a really popular one that gets recommended all the time and look Linux Mint is a great distro there's no doubt about that but it is a LTS distro meaning that one is going to have older packages like the drivers so when it comes to peripheral support or Wi-Fi drivers for certain newer laptops or newer hardware sometimes those things just won't work because of a distro like Linux Mint for example which is an LTS an LTS meaning long-term support so it, you won't be getting the newer packages installed on your computer for those hardware or peripherals working on your Linux desktop. Now there is ways around this obviously you can install Linux Mint and then swap out different packages. Like you can swap out the Mesa, which is, includes drivers in the user space area, like RADV, AMV, which RADV is for AMD cards, AMV is for Intel cards. So you can like update that Mesa package to a newer one. And then your, if you, let's say you have like a newer GPU, for example, then that GPU will behave a lot better because it will have newer patches from that Mesa version. And same goes when it comes to like the kernel, for example, you can swap out the kernel on Linux Mint. I would say that this is not necessarily a mistake it just depends on what hardware that you have if you don't want to muck around with swapping out packages for example or another one is like with linux mint they aren't using wayland yet wayland is a compositor that controls your displays and shows up guis and controls interacts with your hardware and it's pretty new i would say and it's been getting pretty damn good on certain desktop environments like kd plasma and gnome and nvidia has been working really hard and intel and amd they're all been working on the drivers to improve wayland support and for me, like on AMD, I have a really good experience. So when it comes to using a LTS distro, it might be a mistake for you because like if you don't have access to Wayland or an even a experimental version of Wayland that you can try, you'll be missing features like VRR, for example, screen tearing, if you want that, even on X11, you should be able to get screen tearing like out of the box because that's what X11 does automatically. It just tries to do async, I'm pretty sure. And some other things, like if you want to try out HDR, for example, or better fractional 
scaling, then you may not have access to Wayland. And so using a LTS distro might not be the way to go for you. So I would say if you do have hardware that's like a year or two out of date, or I would say just a year out of date, I wouldn't really choose a distro like Linux Mint. There are other better distros. Like for example, if you want to try Fedora is one great distro that I like to recommend to some people. It's a rather, I wouldn't say it's not a rolling distro at all. They do feature releases, but they do get a lot of the newer packages. You get a newer kernel, you get the newer Nvidia drivers, you get the newer desktop environment versions, you get a lot of other things that are newer. So when it comes to your experience on Linux, it's going to be a lot better for you. Now, the next one is something that I just spoke about just before, which is about Wayland and how people aren't really trying out the Wayland desktop. And usually newer users don't know what Wayland is. So when they try something like Linux Mint or Pop! OS, for example, as they use X11 still on the GNOME 42 desktop, you might be missing out on some features that you want to use on your monitor, for example. Like if you wanted to try HDR, or you wanted VRR, or you want to try color profiles, stuff like that, some people do want, or like better fractional scaling also, or better monitor management, things like multi-monitor refresh rates. That is an issue that I've encountered in X11 multiple times, and usually you can and fix it with like a config you can change but a user doesn't really want to do that so Wayland is a great replacement for this and every single x11 developer is working on Wayland now so if anyone wants to comment down below that like x11 is perfectly fine for them that's great when it comes to it being like kind of like deprecated it's kind of deprecated now so it's not really recommended to use x11 anymore and that's why Wayland is default on a lot of desktop environments now I'm like look I'm using KD Plasma right now and it's using Wayland and I've been using it for like, I don't know, a year and a half now since they moved over to like Plasma 6 and it works great. There is no issues now, specifically with 6.2.2 on my AMD hardware. It's great. I can try out HDR if I want to. I can try better fractional scaling. Screen tearing now works in video games when they're full screen. My VRR works perfect. And of course, multi-monitor refresh rates. I have two 144 hertz monitors and then a 60 hertz monitor and they all work as accordingly. You may be wondering actually like what is Wayland? And well, it is a compositor, as I said before. So it controls your monitors, it interacts with your hardware. It basically shows a like a desktop environment GUI. It uses all of that to give you a rather good experience. And as it says here, Wayland is a replacement for the X11 Windows system protocol and architecture with the aim to be easier to develop, extend, and maintain. Wayland is the language protocol that applications can use to talk to a display server in order to make themselves visible and get input from a user, a person. A Wayland server is called a compositor. Application are Wayland clients. Wayland also refers to a system architecture. It is not just a server client relationship between a compositor and applications. There is no single common Wayland server like Xorg is for X11, but every graphical environment brings with it one of many compositor implementations. Window management and the end user experience are often tied to the compositor rather than swappable components. A cool part of Wayland architecture is libWayland, an inter-process communication library that translates a protocol definition in XML to a C language API this library does not implement Wayland, is merely encodes and decodes Wayland messages, yada yada yada. So I would highly recommend that if you are using a newer distro, or even something like Linux Mint for example, definitely give Wayland a shot. And if you are a new user, try and use Wayland if you want newer features like VRR, HDR, better fractional scaling, especially if you have a 1440p or 4k monitor, definitely you should be trying to use Wayland. Like I said, if you have multi-monitor refresh rates, definitely try and use Wayland. I would say. Now the next biggest problem that I see from a new user sometimes, especially with YouTubers who make videos about trying out Linux, is they go to the manufacturer's website to grab a, an NVIDIA driver or an AMD driver. Now for NVIDIA, a Linux distro like Fedora for example, the one I showed before, or Linux Mint, they all have a GUI for either installing the driver or they do have an advanced option which is where you open up the terminal and you enter some commands to actually install the driver from the their repositories because that's where the drivers come from uh, specifically with nvidia is they come from a repository instead of going to a website to grab a .exe so then it can install the driver you just grab it from a repository through a gui usually like if you're on gnome you go through gnome software or if it's on kdi plasma you would go to discover probably and you just click install and then for linux mint like this specific firmware gui manager that i remember that you can go to to see if there's any drivers for you to install like if you have an video card or sometimes the distros will just have the nvidia 
NVIDIA drive is pre-installed for you. So when you actually like boot into the USB, you can pick NVIDIA to actually install the drivers automatically. So you don't have to go through the hassle of actually installing the drivers. And then when it comes to AMD drivers, well, the AMD drivers are pre-installed. So if you don't know in Linux, the drivers for AMD are in the Linux kernel. You have the AMD GPU kernel driver, and then you have Mesa, which is what, like I said before, there's REDV, which is the Vulkan driver, which is used for playing games on Linux. And that's all pre-installed for you. So you don't have to worry necessarily about the drivers being installed or not. But the one thing you need to worry about, and this brings me back to the LTS distros, is if you are using an LTS distro, you'll be using a older version and older patches of the AMD GPU kernel driver, and then older patches in Mesa. So you'll have an older Mesa version and an older kernel, which means you'll get a worse experience when it comes to using a AMD card. And then when it comes to specifically like video editing, like video production stuff, and uh, when it comes to like DaVinci Resolve, for example, as I know people want to use that and they want GPU acceleration, well, you can use a thing called ROCM. That is one package that you can find. And there's OpenCL, I'm pretty sure as well, you can use in conjunction with that ROCM package. And I did try it out today when I was trying out DaVinci Resolve and it did work. And I did have to go to the ArchWiki to look up the specific driver that I wanted to choose. So when it comes to the AMD side of things, everything's pre-installed for you. You don't need to go to a AMD website or an NVIDIA website for NVIDIA drivers to be installed. It's basically for AMD, it's all pre-installed. And same goes with Intel. If you're an Intel user and you do have like an Arc uh, GPU, uh, same thing. Those drivers are all pre-installed for you in the kernel and in Massa because you use ANV, which is the Vulkan driver of playing games. And there's probably some other things that are in there for Intel, of course, and for AMD. Now, one that I like to see a lot of time on Reddit is when people install Ubuntu and you go to the GUI store to install Steam specifically, and they choose the Snap version of Steam. Now, this is not the user's fault, I would say. This is Ubuntu's fault by recommending the Steam version by default as the Snap one to choose for installing. But that's the problem. You shouldn't be picking the Snap version. As Valve has said multiple times that you shouldn't use the Snap version of Steam. They don't maintain it. Uh, Ubuntu developers maintain it. And I often see a lot of times on Reddit that there's a bunch of issues basically when you try to run it and install games and try to pick up extra drives if you want to. I don't really know when it comes to like the permissions of Snap, but I think it's probably not containerized as much as Flatpak, so it should be easier to add drives, but I've seen it plenty of times where people have some random issues like adding drives or Proton doesn't work properly for some reason. Just little things that are kind of annoying. So if you are going to install Steam on a Ubuntu based distro or just Ubuntu itself, you definitely want to go to either the official website of Steam and grab the .debian package. So if we do go here and we just go to Steam, we go install Steam, and then we click install and it should grab the .debian package as we can see there. Now the other way is just go to the GUI and there should be a Steam installer package which will grab the .debian for you automatically. So that's one other way. And the other option is you can choose Flatpak for Steam. Now I wouldn't necessarily recommend Flatpak for Steam because of the permissions which you, you can install Steam Flatpak and just learn the permissions, which is pretty easy. You can grab a package like Flatseal, for example, which I don't have it right now, but I can use the KD Plasma version. And you can actually add the permission for a certain drive that you have mounted. So then Steam can see it and then you can add your Steam library. And another popular one that I like to see on Reddit all the damn time is people using a NTFS file system on their drive for playing games through Proton. Now, this is another thing where the user, I guess, just doesn't really know about the situation where you shouldn't be using NTFS on Linux. You should be using ext4 or BTRFS for a file system when playing games through Proton. That is a thing you need to do. So if you are running an NTFS drive, please, I would actually back up your games or something. Or if you have fast internet, you can just partition the drive and not back up your games. And I would partition it to ext4 or BTRFS. This next one uh, likes to bring me back to the whole grabbing applications through a GUI. And that's the issue. When you are going to grab a application the user usually will go to a website to find a .exe. But on Linux, you 
do not need to do that. I would say the first thing that you should do is open up your GUI store. So you have Discover here, which is one on KDE Plasma for grabbing you know, GUI applications. And then another one for GNOME Desktop would be the GNOME Software Store. You just want to open it and you want to find the application that you want. Now, if you can't find the application in here for some reason, I would then go and try and actually find that said application. And I think the last issue that someone may make a mistake or not necessarily a mistake, but just not learning about the whole package manager situation on Linux, because there are a lot of package managers which can confuse the user sometimes. Now for me, what I usually do is I'll try and use Flatpak as much as possible for most of my GUI applications. And then when I want something like, let's say a video editor that isn't included in Flatpak, which is like DaVinci Resolve, for example, then I would go and find it as a system application and then there are some other ones like a app image that is another one you can go and find when it comes to certain applications that you want to grab you'll usually find those on like github release or something you'll find an app image to download like one for me is nexus mods uh, they only offer a dot app image currently for like easy distribution i would say of the package but they do include some other system packages but i'm not on those distros so my only option is dot app image or the aur and then this one brings me back to the whole steam situation with snap app and then using Flatpak and learning permissions. And yeah, learning permissions when it comes to Flatpak applications can be a little bit confusing for a new user. I would say grab an application like Flatseal, like I said before, this is a great application for just configuring each application because when you install a Flatpak application, usually they don't have a lot of permissions enabled to see much when it comes to your like, let's say a certain file directory, it won't be able to see your root system, it won't be able to see as much as your home that much either. So when it comes to learning that I definitely would try and learn Flatpak as much as possible when it comes to the permission side of things because if you want to like let's say install some random application like I don't know GIMP and for some reason GIMP can't see some file directory then you would go to Flatseal and then turn on the certain permission or you would type the directory of wherever that image or whatever you're trying to add to that application so then GIMP can actually see it the next time you launch it. Now the last one in this video I would say is uh, understanding how Proton works and which Proton to really use when you are playing your games. Now, by default, when you enable Steam Play for all other titles, which I would do this if you want to get actually games working in Proton, it's going to enable Proton Experimental by default. And this is a great by default option, I would say, because Experimental is pretty stable versus Experimental Bleeding Edge, which is like the latest patches from Valve, which can break your wine prefixes. But you should try and understand like which ones you should try and use. Basically, like Experimental, if the game works, great. If it has product issues, I would actually try and use Proton GE. Proton GE is experimental bleeding edge that gets updated every time, but it includes a certain proprietary video codec, so then in certain patches also for certain games that don't want to run necessarily well under the normal Proton runner. So sometimes you may have a game where the, the video codecs just will not work for some reason, and you'll need to force compatibility on a game, which you just go compatibility, force it, and then you would select the latest Proton GE version. Now to get Proton GE, you want to grab an application like Proton Plus. That is a great application for grabbing the latest Proton GE on Steam, or if you want to go to Bottles, which Bottles already has its own options, but for Steam, you go to Proton GE and you would grab the latest version, which is 9-16. I have 9-15 because I don't use Proton GE that much because I don't have many problems. But if you do have codec problems, or if there's some certain issue with the game that like doesn't work in experimental, I would use Proton GE. And then if there's a certain patch that you seem to find that's only available in the latest, latest version of Proton, on, which would be the bleeding edge version and you want to enable that then you would go to experimental you would go on to properties you would go to betas and then you would select uh, bleeding edge latest and untested dsvk bkd 3d proton and wine changes back up your prefixes before using this beta version of experimental and back to the compatibility with run other titles with uh, you don't need to use experimental originally what i would do is i would actually use a stable version which is 9.0-3 uh, because that gets updated every couple of months and the majority of games like 90% of games just work on that version of Proton I would say it's better safe for now just to use experimental so if you're using like a lot of playing a lot of multiplayer games like Apex Legends the finals Halo maybe like Helldivers Overwatch sometimes these games may have a certain update that may break the game under Proton and then you have to wait for an experimental update so it's better safe than sorry to just use experimental and you'll get the latest patches and then you'll just have a rather great time but you can use the stable version of Proton 9.0-3 at the moment and you should have a 
mostly good time I would say. So that does it for today's video. I definitely would give a like on this video. Definitely subscribe to the channel and thank you to my members. I'll show a screenshot of them now. I really do appreciate you guys. And also I would really like to know your opinions again about the mistakes that people may make when moving over to Linux. If there's any type of other issues that I didn't think of. Couldn't really think of any other problems that I've actually seen when it comes to like looking through Reddit, my experiences with stuff like that. So let me know and I'll see you guys in the next video. Peace.